Welcome, um, everybody, uh, back here to a Seagull Talk. And uh, great news is it's the beginning of the Prelude Festival, the very first uh, conversation which we are having here in the uh, Prelude 23 Festival, a festival dedicated to work in progress, celebrating the work of New York theater artists and ensembles, places that host artists. And it's a great um, honor for us to uh, be back uh, after three years of Prelude Online. It is... Um, um, a larger one. We are celebrating our 20th uh, anniversary. We have over uh, 60 presentations with over 120 artists and uh, 17 locations outside the Siegel Center. So it's a, a, a big um, event for us uh, in our history. Also, I don't think we did anything larger than that here in New York. And we also want to give out uh, 14 awards, uh, prelude awards for people who we feel made a great contribution um, to experimental theater, theater at the forefront of performance um, and the art. And um, today we have um, two, uh, two great workers in the field of contemporary theater in New York City and in America, in the Americas uh, with us. Um, I am in our airwaves are here on the Lenape land, so we want to acknowledge that. Um, they might also be out there in PS21, where we have uh, Elena um, um, with us and Steve uh, from uh, the civilians. Um, first of all, how are you both, Elena? Where are you? And uh, uh, and how is life up in Chatham? Hi, Frank. Hi, everybody. Uh, hello, Steve. Um, I am speaking from New York's Hudson Valley, uh, and it's a gorgeous fall day. Uh, leaves already began to change uh, two weeks ago. It's a sunny weather and uh, just a good mood all around. Fantastic. And you are in, in your farmhouse where you live? Uh... Um, I am in a, a barn uh, outside of my, uh, outside of um, a barn that I'm renting in the Hudson Valley, where I spend half of the time and full time during the season. The heavy season at PS21 is normally during the summer, May through middle of October. And that's where I am. And I am um, very happy to see you. Right. Fantastic. Thank you, Elena. We come back uh, shortly to PS21, who you are and what it's all about. So, um, hi, Steve. Where are you? Uh, I am in the Upper West Side, uh, where I, I live in uh, New York City. And though I, I also live part of the time uh, in the Hudson Valley, not too far away from where Elena is right now. Uh, but now, yeah, here I'm, I'm here in the city. I'm uh, in the midst of rehearsing a show, which means... I'm in New York uh, full time, no no trips upstate, um, but yeah, very happy to be here and thanks for uh, thanks for including us in the program. Why we both have with us is because uh, PS Twenty One is hosting um, a work in progress. Something they will show uh, workshops um, up uh, at PS Twenty One. We um, will talk with Steve about it. But Steve, for all of those who don't know, and we are with the civilians. Um, tell us a little bit about the company, the idea, and your your vision for theater. Uh, sure. So the Civilians, we're a New York-based theater company. Uh, we've been around since 2001. So I guess that makes us um, uh, 22, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, which is very exciting. Uh, we are a company that is uh, dedicated to creating new work from creative inquiries into real life. Uh, and that can mean any number of different things. Uh, we we don't describe the work that we do as documentary because I think it's, it's actually uh, almost always some combination of an artistic creative process uh, with a sort of research documentary side. So it's, so it's, it's both. What we do, uh, we describe as investigative theater. So for, for me, that means that the center of the work, whatever it is, uh, is some kind of uh, inquiry. And you know, usually the, the work requires that the, the artists do something to go out and connect with <laughs> other people, other communities, other uh, uh, other subject matters that are, um, you know, that are that are uh, potential to make theater out of them, and 
uh, when we get to it, I, I we'll talk about how uh, our project Sex Variance falls into this mission of investigative theater. Uh, but uh, because it's a more historical piece, but uh, happy to talk about that. Uh, I should I should say that we are, you know, I guess best described as like an independent theater company. You know, we are uh, a community of artists and a staff that you know manages our operations, but we don't we don't have a theater. We don't program a season. We're primarily uh, generative artists, so we we are involved in uh, making the work and. Sometimes we produce it ourselves. Sometimes uh, we produce it in collaboration with arts presenters and a kind of touring setup. Uh, and sometimes we partner with uh, regional theaters or off-Broadway theaters uh, to to actually produce the work. So we're a, we're we're, we're a curious uh, mix of being in in some senses a relatively you know we have we we are. We are uh, a, a small staff and a nimble operation, uh, but our, you know, our, our shows have been, you know, all over the the U.S., um, Europe, at some of the, you know, the leading, the leading theaters in the in the English speaking world. So um, we're small, but we get around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really, and such interesting work, work that is somehow democratic in its core, as it explores reality, real life, the connections, neighborhoods. And um, and it's not a, a commercially based art, you know, which is about um, um, a, a successful um, show, but it's really an engagement of artists with the art form and an investigation um, on human um, life and the meaning of life. And um, and it's also done um, by um, artists for for the love of the work and the belief that theater has a place in society that is contributes to change, change we want to see, and that it's part of a progressive justice and it mirrors, I think, important uh, movements in our society. Next to great artists and companies, of course, we do uh, need places who present the work. And actually, um, there are many places that do present work in New York um, um, with complications, some more, some less. But there are also places that develop work, places that had, they hold and create and house residencies, as we say, next to, to presenting. And um, when it comes to residencies, um, it becomes more complicated. It doesn't really generate money. It really does not uh, uh, have a show at the end you can uh, uh, pay for. But uh, doing it is the essential work. It's like studio time um, for a painter. It's a uh, time to compose for a musician before you know, preparing for a rehearsal. And uh, one of the places I think that are uh, great examples um, of this we have with us here in the Prelude Festival, we have Robert Wilson's Watermill Center. We have the Mercury Store um, in Brooklyn and um, and uh, many others. And one of the great ones, I think, is PS21. And it comes a little bit out of the mastermind of Elena, who is with us. So Elena, tell us a little bit, who are you and what is PS21? Uh, Frank, uh, Steve, thanks both. And Frank, thanks for the generous introduction and for inviting us. Uh, PS21 is a um, relatively new venue. Um, it's a um, state-of-the-art, um, incredible theater uh, on 100 acres of unspoiled um, meadows and uh, peaceful grounds um, in Chatham, which is a small town about 15 minutes um, east uh, of uh, Hudson. So it's uh, within relatively easy reach from New York City, because many of the artists that come to work with us um, are still based in either Brooklyn or Manhattan. And that's mostly who uh, PS21 um, uh, works with, besides a few uh, international residencies. Um, we host um, short and long-term residencies. We sponsor those residencies. Um, we don't have funding the way many other institutions that also have residences part of the mission. We are still trying to develop um, this kind of robust infrastructure that would allow us to support artists. Uh, PS21 started um, 
with a new building in 2018. And um, I am the first executive and artistic director. I joined PS21 in 2019. And pretty much from uh, zero, we developed um, not only audiences, but the donor base and of course, an, um, a stream of uh, programming with very much a focus on innovative multidisciplinary work. And that's the kind of work that we also are incredibly interested in fostering, in encouraging. We have both the Pavilion Theatre, the Black Box, the incredible uh, uh, dance barn um, with the sprung floor. Uh, we also have two artist residence uh, houses on site. And so uh, anybody who is here can have access 24 seven to our spaces. Stay with us on our rambling grounds. It's a 11 bedroom guest house in, in one building and then a small um, uh, cottage with two apartments in, in another building. And of course, artists are very much attracted by uh, the flexibility of space, experimentation that, that really encourages this openness and experimentation uh, with the uh, um, pretty unique setup that we have technologically, including something like state-of-the-art LED lighting, sophisticated sound system, and um, this incredible comfort to be um, in this rural, but also amazing cosmopolitan area where there are a lot of collaborators, artists, visual artists, sound designers, um, they, they all, a lot of people live here, just like what Steve mentioned. He he, he also uh, now has a place in Klaverak and um, many, many artists also now move to this area. We never stopped um, residencies or programming, even during the pandemic in 2020. In fact, we encouraged artists to join us and we ended up in August of 2020 inviting Alarm Will Sound with a residency and workshopping of new music pieces by Tashan Sori and Anais Maivel. In November 2020, we hosted for a week a recording residency with a wonderful sandbox percussion. They uh, recorded and um, the incredible work, uh, Seven Pillars by Andy Akiho. And then later on, we moved on to host um, larger companies and residencies, including Camille A. Brown and dancers, for instance. Um, and just if um, we speak post-pandemic world, um, the residencies are really year round. You know, Steve and the civilians are coming to be with us this December in a few weeks, but um, uh, the residencies are not limited just off season, um, but also during the summer. Um, you know, last summer we had several residencies, one of them a lab, um, a week long lab uh, with Susie Ibarra and um, many guest artists that she invited. Um, she workshopped her, um, the ensemble version of the wonderful piece uh, for meditations on impermanence. Um, PS21 is very much a lab, um, not only with different theater spaces, but also, of course, the grounds and the landscape. And so quite a lot of work that we invite um, uh, to our grounds also has um, quite a bit to do with um, its relation to the landscape and the kind of work, the, the kind of ideas that artists develop. So that's very much um, the mission of PS21. It uh, connects us uh, to the ever evolving national and international landscape, the civilians, especially, um, they, you know, they occupy a particularly important place, I think in American independent theater. Um, it's not the first project in theater per se that we are developing. Two other residencies again during the pandemic included uh, director Pascal Rambert staging the art of theater and in, with my own hand um, with actors, Jim Fletcher and Ishmael Ibn Connor. And so that's probably um, uh, one of the more um, wonderful things that we look forward to because there is always an exchange with artists. Um, we, uh, we, they're not secluded in only also in the, although we understand and respect the time and focus that is required, but um, very much every single residency that we have is always connected to our work um, with communities um, and 
especially under the initiative called Pathways at PS21. Pathways to ourselves, to each other, um, uh, to who embodies our landscape. So that's pretty much in a nutshell where we are with residencies at PS21. Mm -hmm. And again, it's a, it's a particularly challenging uh, time in the United States. We don't have funding for residencies and, and yet just the upkeep of this incredible property and the state of the art theater um, and to keep the lights on is close to $100,000 a year. And I apologize at time um, in this wonderful conversation also go and mention the numbers, but that's the, that's the reality. And um, our team is just four full-time um, uh, uh, comrades on our team, uh, four full-time members, including myself. And we run a season of performance uh, from May through October plus residencies. So it's quite a lot of work. Um, and i um, happy to, to be um, collaborating with Steve, especially. Amazing. It's really an extraordinary place. The programming money, some people say it's the most interesting global programming on the east coast of the of uh, north america and it's really worth uh, to uh, um, uh, check out the upcoming program also but as uh, steve independent now from ps21 what does a residency mean to you a work in progress showing uh well uh, i think i mean a residency can mean can mean many things uh, most residencies uh are for a single artist so I, I certainly benefited from doing a a, a number of residencies at, at places like mcdowell uh etc to, to to go away and concentrate and and work on a script uh what's more challenging to find is a place where you can actually go with your collaborators and develop uh, a show that is a work in process where you don't you don't necessarily you know have a you don't necessarily come in with like a finished script but you might uh, have uh, a lot of ideas or maybe a very rough draft and uh you know for the for the civilians we're you know we're a very collaborative company you know every every project we've done involves uh you know some it requires really like some kind of creative workshop time in order for uh the the show to come into into being and uh you know and i think that's it's very challenging to find those opportunities um we've you know we've certainly done a lot of of developmental workshops at off broadway theaters and regional theaters uh we've done uh, some with presenters uh, like uh, like PS21, uh, and you know uh, we also you know t t we do not have money in, in our budget uh, typically to support uh, a residency, but uh, sometimes we can we find funding or uh, a grant comes through. Um, in this case. Uh, there's this really, really wonderful new program that uh, NISCA, the New York State Council for the Arts, uh, uh, launched. I think we are recipients for its first year, uh, and the grant supports uh, residency time to develop new work um, outside of New York City, uh, with the, the one requirement being that the, the artists have some kind of engagement with the local community. So I think it's, you know, a, a program that is that is trying to you know, connect the artistic culture of New York City to the rest of the state and all of the, all of all of the many many other people that live in in other parts of New York State. So that's that's really the uh the reason we are able to do um these these weeks with with Elena and uh it's um yeah, having <laughs> I guess it kind of goes without saying, but having having money to support what you're doing, you mm -hmm. know, is is uh, essential and is um, you know, and is a game changer. It's a, for you know, it really makes the difference of you know whether a show is going to actually happen, you know, or yeah. or it's just an it's just an idea waiting waiting for a home. Um, so 
So we're we're very glad that we're on the path of making a show that will actually happen. And in fact, Steve, it's at, it's at the core of creation. You know, we need in this country a network of residences, of creation places to foster the new, to foster artistic life and to, to have um, the environment where companies like yours don't have to scramble, you know, every year figuring out where is the grant is going to come from. Uh, what grant are we applying? Can we apply for the same grant if we were recipients last year? I'm I'm almost surmising that who knows whether you, you will receive it next year. But this kind of funding system and support should be foundational. Definitely. Definitely. For for creative life. Mm -hmm. uh, when not, is a, not, uh, <clears throat> Steve? When is a residency a good residency? Uh, well, I mean, most, most residency I've, 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 uh, have done, uh, and, and we have done many, uh, have, have all been good residencies. I, I think, you know, first and foremost, uh, is there, uh, is there time and space, uh, and, and freedom to go into the studio, uh, without, without any expectations or pressure of, uh, we're going to deliver a certain kind of product by the end of these two weeks, even because sometimes you can have a work in progress showing at the end of a residency time. Uh, and yeah, I would say in, in many cases, especially working with a producing theater, uh, that there's there's a couple things in play. There's the like, yeah, here's your time to figure out your show, experiment, work with actors. Uh, it's very open-ended. But at the end of the residency, we are going to look at it and decide whether we're going to keep going, whether we're going to keep supporting a show, or or not. So, uh, yes, we've done we've done many residencies where, where there's, there's that added pressure of, uh, you know, are we going to get produced, um, are, or are they not interested in what we're doing and getting cut off? Um, the, so. You know the, the the programs that I find really um, uh, most uh, most helpful or or, or just, and and most most artistically satisfying really are the the ones where there there isn't that you know will we do your show or not uh, question at the very end uh, and uh, certainly PS twenty one is is that type of of program uh, the Sundance Theater Lab was that kind of program and, and we were in residence with them many times and I think the loss the loss of that is a is a serious blow to the American theater. So much so much work um came out of the many different programs that that Sundance supported. Uh and uh I guess the last thing I would say is um I I believe in uh, dramaturgs. So I, I, I've always worked closely with with dramaturgs, and sometimes uh, there's the capacity to to bring one for your workshop, and sometimes not. Uh, some programs like like uh, Sundance had its its own dramaturgical staff, so you were you were given you know one of the best dramaturgs in the country to be your your partner for that one week or that two weeks uh, or whatever it is. And I think it's so uh, I mean, essential for theater to have somebody in the room that knows what you're trying to do and tells you honestly every day, uh, you're going in the right direction or you've taken a wrong turn and I don't know, I don't know where you're going. Maybe you should consider that. Um, and they, they, yeah, really do do so much uh, to bring new work to life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it, it is so it is so um, um, foundational. There is the it, biologists say sperms ideas are cheap, but nests, eggs, building something that's expensive and complicated and dangerous. Elena, why don't you do what everybody else does? You know, if you have some money, you have a show, you book a show, you pay artists, and you go them in. On why do you do residencies? In our case, it's very much fostering the kind of landscape which we believe is essential for 
um, maintaining artistic life. Um, it's also very much a focus on the kind of work that is outside of the um, you know commercial realm and mainstream and recognize names because we think that this ecosystem of small ensembles, small independent theater groups like the civilians, uh, that is what creates this ecology of the healthy landscape and um, vibrant artistic life. And the third is our very much focus on innovation and um, multidisciplinarity of the, the the kind of artists that work um, um, without specific um, boundaries in their respective discipline that combine different disciplines. That's the kind of work we are very much interested in 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 music. We don't separate disciplines. In fact, I um, it, we only do it even with our normal season, when we have um, this, the busy summer season, we I don't even like to write, oh, this is dance, this is music, because uh, the kind of project that we bring and really make an effort to bring and a lot of international work, you know, a good example of it is the work Le Tang by Giselle Vian that is coming to us. Um, it's in its uh, North American uh, premiere of the English version of Le Tang with Julie Shanahan and um, Adele Nell. Um, Anima from France, also the kind of project that um, that that reflects that completely um, lack of demarcation between performance or performance art and visual art. Um, combining in the most um, incredible, um, unusual way. Um, you know, in the case of Letang, the disciplines that I have not ever seen combined before. Uh, that was the work that we ended our summer season with. Um, so th that that is very much the focus and the mindset. Uh, but we really think that support of the artist is something that is so uh, powerfully lacking. Um, there is a group of beloved artists and everybody starts with the commissioning their work, but there are so many other um, important ideas. And we think that, that, that fostering the work of many small um, ensembles, um, it's probably a very difficult and challenging pattern uh, but essential one. We don't tie the residency, as Steve said, to the to the presentation. And I think that that kind of um, freewheeling landscape of work is the most nurturing mm -hmm. and the most so you, productive for artists. So, so you're offering residencies um, and you don't know what the play might be, whether you will ever produce it or not, just for artists as a as a as a research and some of them you say we give you the residency and you will then definitely perform um well um you, you know some of some yes and i think eventually uh, besides what steve brought up I, the role of the dramaturg i think that also the role of the producer and in the ideal world we would have wide network of creation places for creation we would have those networks and places of creation that come with it with artist support including tech support including uh, salaries and travel but also including of course the opportunity to then disseminate the work the role of the dramaturg plus the role of the producer who would also help this this work not to be seen or shown once or twice and in the case of some of the residencies we just wanted to give um a kind of enable an exp a, a trial for somebody very young like Katiana Rangel, the Brazilian theater artist. She was with us working on Blasted. And um, yes, we don't put any conditions. And when we had a work in process showing, some of the people absolutely hated it and, and wrote us letters how much they hated the work. Um, but you know, we we don't we we don't really yeah, care. Audience our, members wrote you, yeah. Our do you members, um, exactly as an artistic director? Do you interfere? You say this is good, that is not. I like that. Do you are you also dramaturgically? Do you have some connection, or do you step back and don't look at all? Are you involved? Um, 
Uh, be, well, first of all, I'm always interested in what our artists do. And as much as possible, we, uh, because we are very much connected to the international landscape, uh, PS21 brings a um, huge number um, of international projects every year. Um, and uh, as much as we can, our involvement is, is pretty much giving any connections we can, any connections in the field, connections with our presenting partners, with other presenters, not just in the United States, but internationally, and anything we can help. But also the kind of support, um, very informal support goes, um, there are so many fantastic theater, you know, lighting designers, sound designers, um, all the people that, cre that create work and those who are known to us. So if somebody is looking for a, a, a a collaborator, a producer, we normally recommend and share our resources as much as possible in this way. Um, of course, we do have discussions with artists about their own work, uh, but to say that we have some kind of an imprint um, or, <laughs> or we, we, we guide, drive it in any way, that is, it's, that's not really the case. That's the case. Steve, now let's come to uh, what this talk is all about. Um, you will come with the help of NISCA, of that great grant, I think, to you know encourage um, also community work, which you have always done without grants. Actually, I would like to point that out. Civilians is one of the early companies that actively work with non-actors, community members. Now it's often, you know, people tailor their work according to, to, to grants. You're gonna come to research sex variants 19, 41, based on Dr. George Henry's interviews. Um, tell us a little bit about this project. Why is that interesting to you? What are you going to do? In uh, uh, sure, sure. So, uh, you know, this this is an, an idea that, uh, let me do the math. I can't, uh, sometime in the 1990s, uh, when I was living in London, uh, I found a copy of Sex Variants in a used bookstore. Uh, it was this great big uh, medical book that contained within it uh, 80 case studies of what they considered variants uh, and to clarify the, the using the term sex uh, uh, to mean gender. So what they what they considered to be gender variations, which included homosexual men, bisexual men, homosexual women, uh, and then a third category that they called narcissists, uh, which uh, contain a lot of different um, colorful, colorful individuals. Uh, and the, you know, the book, the book just captivated me. And, uh, you know, there, there is, there's, as, as a gay person, you know, it's very, very hard to have any sense of our, our history, because it's mostly invisible. Uh, and it's not documented. And, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, everyday life, um, you know, sexuality, relationships, uh, you know, so much of so much of that content was just was, was never was never documented uh, or uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So start starting there, uh, I. You know, I, as soon as I read it, I thought this somehow needs to be a theater piece, and then I just kind of kept it in my back pocket for, you know, another 15, 20 years, uh, and then it's uh, the 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 first iteration of the project we did at, at Joe's Pub as just a one night event, and I asked a bunch of uh, songwriters to pick a, pick a case study. Uh, and make uh, make music from it. Uh, I edited uh, many of them down to to monologues, uh, and we did an evening uh, at at Joe's Pub that was a, a big hit. And I, I think I think audiences um, in, uh, felt the same way I did um, about this material. Uh, and actually, one thing that's very important just to do uh, say about um, the source material is it's 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 very much uh, uh, a, a mixed bag, as it were. 
So there, there are all of these, you know, first person interviews with queer people talking about all aspects of their, their life, you know, which I think is just an incredible resource. And at the same time, uh, it's all in the context of medical study. It's all in the context of, you know, what has made these people wrong. Uh, and, you know, in a 1930s context, they really, they threw everything, uh, they threw every uh, um, pseudoscience that they could at the problem of queer people. So their, you know, the dimensions of their heads were measured. They were, many of them were photographed naked to see if there was something about the torso to leg ratio that might be causing these these variations uh, for most all of the many of the women uh, had their uh, had their genitals drawn and measured and those are in the back of the book uh, labeled uh, where where there might be you know abnormalities of the of the genitals the um, the genetic side was it was had its moments so for each case study there's a family tree you know and it's marked. It's marked like who is an alcoholic, uh, who is musical, uh, turned out to be one of one of the categories, uh, who, who, you know, who was divorced, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, and, and again, all that said, like within the context of the 1930s, I think the doctors who were behind this medical book thought that they were doing something progressive because they were advocating for the idea that queer people are sick and, um, maladjusted uh, in terms of their gender and therefore potentially rehabilitated. Uh, and, you know, that in contrast to, uh, you know, um, the the way that most of society like treated, uh, thought of queer people uh, as, um, you know, degenerates that should be uh, arrested and, and punished uh, because, you know, in the 1930s it was, uh, it, it was illegal just to be queer. You didn't have to even do anything. You could be, you know, having a coffee with your lesbian friend in a lesbian bookstore, you know, and technically that was that was illegal. So, you know, all, all, all to say that the, the people behind the study, you know, thought that they were doing something progressive. Uh, and it's an American uh, writer, George Henry. You bought the book in London, but it's Americans were interviewed in the 30s um, yeah. about their life histories yeah yeah all 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 americans uh and then you know as we've as i've learned more about the project and dug into it a bit deeper the the backstory of the book and the study is really quite fascinating and i think says a lot it says a lot about just sort of um you know the how how queer people uh exist you know even in in contemporary times because the the origin of the whole project actually was initiated uh, by a lesbian journalist named Jan Gay. And she had been in touch um, with Dr. Hirschfeld in um, Weimar era Germany, who was Magnus a, a Hirschfeld, real yeah. Magnus Hirschfeld. And uh, from that, she got, she got a copy of his sexuality questionnaire. And then she interviewed something like 200 or 300 lesbians all over Europe and in the US. Uh, and then she wanted to get it published. And I think, you know, very much with a sense of, you know, here, uh, here are some descriptions of, you know, real people, how they live, what their relationships are like. Uh, and, and I think Jan wanted to put that in print to then share that with the world and, and uh, in a sense, make a case for uh, equality and liberation and you know whatever whatever other positive things might have come from that book uh, but she quickly found out that you could not you could not publish a book in the 1930s that was just uh um she was told that she didn't have the right credentials like as a journalist uh, she could never get this thing published the only way that she could get it out there was to do it in the context of a medical study so jan herself actually recruited the doctors who eventually became the committee for the study of sex variants mm -hmm. and 
many of the interviews we think were done by Jan. Uh, there was another, um, there was a gay guy named Thomas Painter uh, who similarly, I think, had um, more, uh, more of sort of a, a, a kind of contemporary or, or positive intention. Uh, he brought a lot of men into the study. Uh, and, and then when the study was eventually published, you know, Jan, Jan, I think gets like one or two sentences of, of mention. Uh, and, and Dr. Henry really presents himself as the, as the authoritative voice on, you know, what, um, what a person's life history means, uh, what might have caused their their maladjustment and you know and uh, essentially it is uh, you know a, a big study that contributed to the the uh, what we call you know maybe the the medicalization of of queer lives and queer mm -hmm. bodies which how, how will you connect it if i understand the grant is to connect to community um also say how what's your idea uh, well, I think when we're um, when we're up in in Chatham, uh, I will, you know, leave it to Elena to make some introductions, uh, and you know, I uh, imagine we'll you know meet meet some uh, uh, audience members and supporters of PS Twenty One at, uh, at at dinner or whatever that might be, and and we will do a public sharing. We'll, we will we will share the work in progress with. A small audience, and and then and then have a have a discussion, but uh, it will be really more like a work in progress presentation, as opposed to you know showtime. Mm -hmm. And we also and our specific uh, Frank, our specific interest is um, uh, not just the more um, conventional model of a work in progress showing to the general audience, and because we. We don't want, to, I don't like that word of community as if it's us and them. We are the community. And um, this initiative I mentioned in my introduction first, Pathways, um, mm -hmm. it's very much our initiative of also working with community groups and regional organizations. And since we launched this initiative in 2020, our partnerships grew to 26. And so in the case of the civilians and this project, we are specifically thinking of adding a couple of um, events or conversations with our um, community partners in Hudson, um, specifically the 10th magazine. It's a magazine for queer youth in Hudson, uh, mostly uh, youth of um, uh, color. And there are a number of partners um, in Hudson that we have been working with over the years. And so there are also other I, th I would say a more meaningful conversations that we can develop with uh, with smaller groups, not just the general audience, which, and I think this project is fascinating and, and, and our audiences should know about it. We are very excited about it, but it's also about um, really the artists and Steve sharing, sharing their, their work um, with, um, with young people, especially. Mm -hmm. Will you also do interviews with people up there, uh, Steve? Um, no, probably, probably not. We are, we're very much kind of st sticking to the source of our, of our interviews being these, these historical transcripts. I mean, I will talk to people and I talk to people all the time mm -hmm. to get, mm -hmm. yeah, to get ideas to, uh, especially if someone's seen a piece of the work, uh, I, you know, we'll, we'll uh, have many, many conversations with uh, all sorts of people that that can then, you know, help uh, help my path on the work. Mm -hmm. You're also going to collaborate with Jessica Mitrani and Ada Westfall. Tell us a little bit who are the col collaborators you're bringing in. Uh, yeah, so there's there's a, a few uh, for the first part of the residency. Um, it'll be some of the the primary collaborators. So. In addition to me, uh, Jessica Mitrani uh, is a Colombian artist based in New York. Uh, she works in performance, um, but uh, she describes herself uh, as a multimedia artist. So uh, she does she works in many media, but um, 
particularly video, which I think uh, will be an important part of uh, of this show. Uh, Ada Westfall is a performer, uh, musician, and uh, music director, and we will have a number of songs in the show written by uh, various composers, and uh, you know Ada will uh, eventually be the music director, but uh, she's involved sort of at this at this sort of early stage. We're, we're really figuring out what the project is uh and i've also brought on a a young playwright named james labella who i i gave him the job of uh writing writing various scenes about all about the backstory of the sex variance study so you know trying trying to imagine uh jan gay with her various uh, <laughs> the various meetings that we know mm -hmm. that she had attempts that she had to try to get to get the work done, uh, and his work is really delightful. I, I asked him to write every scene in a, in a different genre of a of a nineteen thirties movie. So there's like there's a screwball scene, there's a uh, you know universal horror classic, uh, there's the sort of you know fast talking uh, uh, kind of like His Girl Friday, <laughs> Rosalind Russell type movie. Uh, and you know it's all still very much an experiment and I'm not really sure how 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 it will all work in the end but uh it's a yeah it's a very important part of the residency to just you know have have that group of collaborators there to work together but to also hang out afterwards and to talk about what we learned what we're going to do next uh, and then in our final week we will be jo joined by you know some number of, of actors so we can we can start reading and having some of the songs performed, uh, and then uh, I can I can start figuring out how it all how it all fits together. Amazing, yeah. James Labella, who actually also is in Prelude, with a piece of its own, um, with us. Um, I think the great Martha Graham said, um, "Sometimes I create movements, but sometimes also movements come to me." She says, "I create a space, I have a rehearsal, and things happen." You know, and it's not planned and it's not written out. You know, it would be horrible when if artists had to work like business people where you have to make a three year plan and then you have to stick to it. You know, this right. is not how artistic life works and artwork and great art on the on the opposite. You don't know how it's going to look like um, you regroup. Things don't work out as you thought. You make mistakes or failures, but then you redo it. It changes the minute before openings. But this is also, I think, what we can learn from artists. We should life work in that way. Uh, institutions should work in that way and take risks and openings. But the space that residencies give for these rooms where encounters take place, and as Michelangelo said, everything is movement. You know, everything is encounter. Um, and I think this is why I feel this is so great, so fundamental and so close to nature in a way sense. And I think Elena is right when she says, you know, the community, if you say it, you pretend as if you're not part of it or you just say nature, that you're not nature. You know, this is, the, I think, so um, so great, the, the, the chaotic creation of art that um, mimics the nature of who we are. Um, Elena, why do you think this project fits so well into your programming? It's very different from what you uh, uh, um, is it very different from what you normally know, present, or is it in a, is there a red thread that goes through it? There is really not. The, the, that's not how we think. Whether it fits um, it in that box of how we imagine, because we we may imagine um, our own space ideas in one way, but ultimately, um, you know, it's a gut instinct, but also this is such a fascinating material that the civilians are developing. Um, it's what Steve said, it's a, you know, you know it's an uncharted a territory in the, there's just so little documentation. And so as soon as I read about the project from Steve, I immediately without thinking said yes. So it wasn't even about, how it relates or not relates to our work. It's uh, more whether these ideas um, have to be supported and these artists have to be supported. And it's a, it's a very serious project and that's pretty much the, the, the only determinant 
uh, mm -hmm. in how we think about resonances also in general. Yeah, yeah. Like you, you sit in this beautiful big space at the moment, and your door behind you is open, um, is an open door. Um, and um, as you said, it's not something that be put in an existing box. So it's quite a fascinating place you run, well, how the way you do it. And um, and people um, um, can really discover that. I think Jewel, hopefully also Prelude, will contribute a little bit um, um, towards that, the work of the civilians of Steve, but also to the mission idea and vision of PS. They call themselves of the, the performing space of a 21st century. So it's interesting to what, what does she think? What does the organization think we should be doing? What's the meaning of it? How does it relate to our life? And what is worth our time and energy? And yes, um, also um, the money, because art is worth something after all. Um, and we spend for it. Um, Steve, uh, we should not uh, end the conversation. We are closer to the end before touching that we will see you soon in New York City um, with uh, artificial flavors. Tell us a little bit. What, what, what is that? And how did that start? Was that a residency? Uh, you know, that was uh, also born from a residency, a kind of different residency because it was local in New York. But last spring, we were artists in residence uh, at the WNYC's uh, uh, Green Space, which if you're not familiar with it, is a, a, a theater that's in the WNYC building uh, that has all kinds of programming. And we did we did three shows over the course of our residency, and then the the first one uh, it had a different title than what, what we call it now, but it was uh, a show born just from my experiments with with writing plays using artificial intelligence, and we shared you know a bit of excerpts from various conversations with robots that I'd been having. Uh, and and then we figured out how to use chat GPT to actually generate uh, what we did then is like a 20 minute musical. And the actors were getting their lyrics right when it was time for them to sing. Uh, the The music director had established some chords, like the kind of new more or less where a song might go but all the actors had to improvise the melodies on the spot uh, and do duets and sing choruses together. Uh, and it was, it was just really a wonderful and electrifying event. And as soon as, as soon as we had that night at WNYC, uh, I said, we must, we must make a, a like a full uh, sh a regular length run show uh, in New York as soon as humanly possible. Uh, so that's that's what's happening starting October 22nd at uh, 59 East 59 theaters. Uh, the show is called Artificial Flavors. And uh, uh, yes, we are, I'm here because it's, it's our one day off. So we are in, in rehearsal for it uh, right now. And uh, yeah, and we are we are learning all sorts of things of how to get algorithms to to write musicals. <laughs> uh, and um, yeah, I think you kind of just have to see it to really uh, and, and know what all that what all that might mean. Yeah, incredible uh, investigation into uh, contemporary new media technology. The great Ancier, the philosopher, said when traditional art forms like theater meet a new technology then it gets interesting, you know, and mm. both on their own often um, struggle. But um, that's uh, and that moment when there's hot and cold or when those continental plates so of new, what is about to come, and that's what we have, or we have in the past collide, something, something happens. And Elena, what's happening? What are your plans, the upcoming plans for uh, PS21? What do you do? What's happening in the next years? And what do you dream about? What would you love to do? Well, uh, I think I already um, intimated what our dream uh, may be for the residencies. It's really fostering and pressing uh, to kind of, I don't know who, funders, the government, the importance of places of creation and the importance of this kind of no strings attached support, but also almost formalizing the places of creation as Steve described with the dramaturgical support 
Um, it's absolutely essential. As far as our plants, we, um, after a very busy summer season um, that uh, we launched in May, and uh, we are continuing with the fall and also pretty robust um, lineup of what we are presenting besides Giselle Vian and Letang uh, next weekend, uh, we move and just now, um, even yesterday, we had a wonderful artist, Wanjiro Kamuyo in residency with us. She stayed for a week um, and focused in, only on her own work. She used our dance barn, um, our stage, and um, it was wonderful to have anybody who stays with us for a week. The fact that we can get to know the artists, their creative process, their share um, the sense of camaraderie um, and community, artistic community, but also um, with Wanjiro, for instance, we held fantastic workshops with our partner organization. It's a youth serving organization in Hudson uh, called uh, Kite's Nest. And so for our uh, wonderful young um, audience members, young participants, it was great to get to know Wanjiro. And they, they said, can she come to be with us every day? And then we move on with another residency by the French choreographer Anne Collot, who will be uh, kind of exploring ideas of the past work of pioneers like Anna Halprin and uh, Simone Forti and Trisha Brown uh, to develop new relationships with surroundings and her uh, choreography with three performers will unfold in our landscape. It's very much landscape related work. And then finally, in November, we are presenting also a new piece um, by, with Claire Chase and Winston Brown, uh, one with Claire Chase is based on Pauline Oliveris' intensity um, series, and it's a piece about Claire's grandmother, and it's combined with a dramatic piece. It's a story um, dramatized by actor, very charming, eccentric um, uh, uh, story about Vincent Brown's mother. And finally, we conclude with Steve's residency by the civilians uh, and then a solstice concert by Talea Ensemble. We present quite a lot of contemporary music. That's all, all another um, notable kind of programmatic um, intentions of PS21. And working on 2024, I will, since I mentioned money once, perhaps you'll allow me to mention it again, but our budget is less than a million dollars. There are only four of us, um, and we do a very extensive, almost year-round um, programming plus residencies. Yeah, incredible work to you do the fundraising too, next to the artistic work. It's a miracle you you got this done. You got it running and flying on that beautiful high altitude. Um, amazing. Um, we have a couple of minutes left, one or two. Steve, what are your what are upcoming projects of the civilians? Because what we talk about is in the works or will come. What else is on the radar? Uh, well, we are developing a lot, a lot of new work. Uh, we we just launched uh, a major initiative that we've been working on for several years uh, called the Next Forever Initiative. And it's a partnership uh, between us, uh, Princeton University's High Meadows Environmental Institute uh, and Princeton's uh, Lewis Art Center. And the idea is that we will uh, do a number of different facets, uh, uh, really dig in to uh, explore the question of like how how can dramatic narrative storytelling uh, engage the complex environmental stories or climate stories uh, or you know those 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 issues that are. Uh, so in incredibly important um, and honestly very difficult to to tell stories about them uh, to kind of exp uh, dig in uh, to you know a subject like climate change and figure out you know what um, how to make a ninety minute show that's going to you know effectively do something to move the conversation forward uh, is is tricky. So we are we've launched the first two writers 
um, with uh, Ardai Knox and Kareem uh, Fami, and they will be working uh, throughout this year. Uh, Princeton will offer them access to faculty members who might have expertise in uh, aspects of the work that they're writing. Uh, and then uh, we we teach. I'm teaching a class at Princeton on the subject of of environmental storytelling, and we have um, we have a commitment to do this for at least three years, and and hopefully we'll keep going. and And we are working to expand and grow the program. Uh, and the next big phase is, I think, raising the money to um, produce some of these shows because uh, I. I know. I think it's um, you know, it is the biggest existential issue facing all people yeah. in the world uh, yeah. uh, right now. So amazing, um, yeah. How 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 great also that art and theater and universities come together. That we have places out in a farm. It's important to decentralize American theater. It should not only happen in the metropolises that people think if it's not in downtown or Brooklyn, it's not worth anything. Completely wrong. We have to rethink everything. Requestion everything, have communities, rural communities engage. Um, and this is all part of our um, mission as artists and presenters. And I think you both are excellent examples, you know, of a 21st century um, an engagement in the art in a meaningful, a, a powerful, and also engagement that has an impact and makes a difference. And as we now learn in physics that perhaps even our universe is participatory, that is changes in the way it's being observed. Uh, if I understand these new ideas right, you know, we need to participate, we need to engage, we have to go in the houses of people and the stories of people instead, you know, going to the palaces, you know, of the French castles of, you know, monarchistic regimes. And often I feel even when we go in the big theaters, we still go into castles and we do not go into the minds and houses of people and uh, ask them to participate in what is the great democratic project that art um, is a part of, of the Enlightenment. So you both are great workers for that. Thank you all for taking the time, especially you, Steve, in the middle of the preparation. I can't believe you have the opening soon in, on your free day. You even have to do a lunch, uh, a Zoom call, and don't get to eat uh, right away and in peace. So we really thank you. It means the world to us. Thanks to HowlRound. Um, for hosting us and to everybody listening, please do join Prelude. It's on the SiegelCenter.org. It's live streamed on HowlRound. A lot of it, not everything, but um, it's a great investigation showing of a work in progress of over 60 artists on the ensembles just from New York City. Thank you all and uh, have a great day. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for having Thanks. us. Thanks for having us, Thank Frank. You. Bye, Steve. Pleasure. Thank you. Bye.